Herding cats, boy, we say that to our docs, but it's true with everybody in healthcare. Why? Because it's such a high risk endeavor that people get afraid to make any changes at all. Lucian was talking about this. Sue, I think you mentioned it too. The, the fear of change, the fear of going up against this is the way we've always done it is not an not understandable fear. It's an understandable fear, but we must get past it. We have to push past it. Communications to occur, we have to be brave enough to talk about it in those ways. Uh, let, let, me, let me show you a, um, this is probably the cheesiest slide that I've got. I went out and found one picture and duplicated it. But I want to show you the three, in my view, pedestals of patient safety. Sue was talking about one of them. Patient-centric care. Now, I, I coined centric instead of centered because everything we do is patient-centered, but patient-centric is on a higher level. And in so many words, you said the same thing, which is the definition, everything. I mean everything. Everything has to be subordinate to the best interests of the patient. Do we practice that way today? Absolutely not. We have medical apartheid. Doctors over here, everybody else over here. It's nobody's fault, but we've got to stop it. The doctors have got to be the leaders, but they've got to be the leaders inside, inside each institution, whether it is a day surgery center, whether it's a major hospital. They've got to be the leaders that say, I take great pride in saying to you, you know, I'm a very good doctor. Just like I said, I'm a very good aircraft commander to my people, a very good captain. But I'm a carbon-based human being, and I cannot be perfect. However, my pride is not in pretending to be perfect. My pride is in knowing that I can wrap a group of people around me as a cohesive team and teach them and nurture them so well that no one on that team would hesitate for a nanosecond to speak up if they ever saw, heard, felt anything was wrong or even intuited it with no foundation. That, that is a matter of pride. And that is so totally different from the Captain Kirk model. That's what we call the Captain Picard model. For those of you who are aficionados of Star Trek Next Generation, you remember it was a, a uh, Frenchman with a British accent played by a Shakespearean actor. But <laughs> unlike the first captain, when somebody threatened his ship or something threatened his ship, he would gather his people and listen to them. He was still a strong leader. He still made the final decision. But you could always chase him down on the way to the bridge and, and give him more information. Not so with Kirk. That's a huge difference. The difference in leadership is this. Leadership, in my definition, is defined, as somebody defines himself or herself as a leader in terms of quality by how well that leader can extract, orchestrate, and apply all the human talent available to that leader. Totally different definition than I am omnipotent and infallible. The second one is best practices and minimization of variables. We, in aviation, again, I'm putting you in my airplane. I'm the captain. Would you fly with me if you knew I had preference cards? I assume most of you know what preference cards are. This is what a surgeon has, so they'll tell them exactly how he wants the OR set up, and nobody else has the same thing. I'm at war with preference cards, but this is the, the silliness of it. We know that we have best practices in aviation, and you want me to follow it. For instance, one of our best practices is putting the landing gear down before we put the airplane on the ground. <laughs> Now, if I wanted to be like a surgeon, I'd turn to my co-pilot and say, I'm in charge here, man, and, and I will tell you when I want the gear, if I want the gear, okay? Don't give me any advice. Gear down. <laughs> the Air Force, they always told us, you'll know when you've landed gear up because the altimeter reads three feet lower and it takes maximum power to taxi. It's very embarrassing and a lot of noise. <laughs> Minimization of variables means that what we want is the alacrity of a human brain focused on ways that only a human can focus. Why reinvent the wheel? Let me give you an example of this. And, and you'll find, as a matter of fact, in one of the inserts there, uh, this, this very picture, one of the pictures I'm going to show you. I'll come back to the pedestals before I wrap this up. There you go. You remember this. This was the inauguration of service between LaGuardia and the Hudson by US Air a couple of years ago. <laughs> Didn't turn out terribly well. In the left seat was a fellow I've gotten to know, and he's helping us in healthcare with his notoriety, and that's uh, Sully Sullenberger. In the right seat was an almost captain qualified first officer, Jeff Skiles. You may not know that this is what really happened, by the way. First class got the wraps, <laughs> and coach got the wings. Uh, <laughs> you know they overran the geese. Leah had this in, in her article. The geese, if they see you coming, they'll dive out of the way. They didn't see this airplane coming. And with two giant Cuisinarts under the wing, it ate up enough of them that they stopped running. So the crew knows now they can't get them restarted. They go through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of denial in about 4.2 seconds, turn towards the Hudson, and now they got 15 seconds to make the most important decision of their careers. 
15 seconds is what some of this sounded like on the... Uh, Jack is 15.49, runway 4 is available if you want to make left track to runway 4. It is available. Okay. Okay. Uh, once over to our right, it is in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro. Sorry. Okay, you're off your right side is Teterboro Airport. Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes. Teterboro, uh, okay, look away, depart sky, emergency inbound. Jack is 1529 over the George Washington Bridge, wants to go to the airport right now. Yeah, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for uh, runway 1? Runway 1, that's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280, you can land runway right. 1 at Cedarboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Cedarboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. We're going to be in the Hudson, and indeed they were. Now, one thing, if you hold, heard the whole tape, you, you hear the flight number was actually 1549, but because of the tension, it became 1539 and then 1529, <laughs> and progressively. <laughs> they had 15 seconds to decide what to do. Now. There was no miracle of the Hudson, by the way, unless you want to argue with me that it was a miracle, that it was a calm day, and there was no wave activity on the water, and I'll sign off on that. But no miracle about them surviving the landing in the water. You know why? Because we learned a long time ago that if we figure out a way to do something, you do it that way every time. So we teach in every airplane. I used to have people ask me when I was flying a 747, can you put one of these in the water? Yeah, once, <laughs> only once. But we know the procedure for it because it's in the book. And on ground school, you learn it. You never have to relearn it. You always know it. So there was a procedure for putting it in the water. There was a procedure for gliding to Teterboro, the, air, air, pardon me, the airport right across the Hudson that they could see and they were asking about. This is where a pilot wants to go. You want to be able to put the airplane down safely, call the company and say, we're OK. All the passengers are OK. And we saved your $85 million airplane. Not, we're OK, the passengers are OK, and sorry about your bird. Uh, <laughs> There is a huge incentive to go to that airport, and they don't know if they've got enough airspeed. They think they do, but they don't have a guarantee on it. So what's pulling them like a siren song is a concrete runway. And they've got this watery runway, but they know the consequences of landing there. They know that everybody will survive it, but they know they're going to lose the airplane. That's going to be embarrassing, and it's going to be wet. So in making that decision, if they had not had procedures, the procedure for going to Teterboro, by the way, has to do with keeping the airspeed exactly at the same value, which is called L over D max, lift over drag maximum. Airbus makes it easy. They give you a little green dot, you match it with a little brown line by means of pitch control, and you are at that airspeed. So door one, door two, procedure A, procedure B. What if they didn't have those procedures? Here's what that tape would have sounded like for 15 seconds. Hey, Jeff, what do you think? Is L over D max 235, 250, 215, 200, 195? And, and I know I've got to use some flaps, or at least I think I do. Do I? And if I do, is it flaps 5, flaps 10, flaps 15? And I put it in the water, I've got to keep the wings level. But do we do it at marker minus 5, marker minus 10? There go your 15 seconds right there. Any sort of a panel discussion over what to do. And they're going to, because I've talked to both of these guys extensively, they're going to look up and see themselves sinking in relation to that airport that they really desperately want to go to. And they're going to make an emotional decision like any of us would in that circumstance. They're going to go to Teterboro and they are going to die. Because they're going to go into a mile short of the runway, a housing development of brick houses at 150 knots in what is essentially a metallic eggshell. And no one's going to make it through that. And a lot of people on the ground will die. They didn't know it at the time. It took a month to crunch the numbers. But the reason we got them back is because we had unloaded their minds, like we've got to unload every surgeon, every nurse, every anesthesiologist, everybody in healthcare, to be able to bring the best to bear on the problem by minimizing the variables. They were able to say, you know what? That's a gamble. That's life. We're going for the river. That's why we got them back. And of course, it's a good picture of Sully. Uh, you know how we are as Americans. We put somebody on a pedestal, we immediately try to knock them down with a mud ball. So within a month, I was getting this in my mailbox. Uh, <laughs> first pedestal is patient-centric care. Second is minimization of variables and best practices. And the third one is collegial interactive teams. This is the beating heart of what we need. We don't know how to do this in healthcare, but we've got to learn, and we've got to have a crash course, and we've got to be teaching it in simulation. And this can't be esoteric, and it can't take five or ten years, because people are dying for us to get this done, literally. Collegial interactive team. Why not collaborative? Yeah, you can get a bunch of silos to collaborate. Collegial is a different level. Collegial means everybody has respect for everybody else. Even that brand new two-year graduate nurse who just came on board, who's wide-eyed and has been told essentially to sit down and shut up and maybe you'll have an opinion in a year or two in, in normal circumstances and a collegial interactive team is welcomed. 
by the leader and everybody else as an equal member of the team. You know, for one reason, coming out of academia, they've got a view of things that we don't have. They've got a capability of saying, wait a minute, did you know about such and such? A collegial interactive team is one which the leader has said just exactly what I was saying before. I am a very good doctor, but not because I can be perfect, but because I can put a team around me that'll catch anything.